Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Quarant, and I'm president of the Delaware State Chamber of Commerce, and thank you for joining our webinar this morning, Creating a Door of Opportunity, an Employer's Role. It's a very important conversation, and we're really excited to hear what our presenters have to say to us today. Um, before we get to them, and before I introduce uh, Tom Horn from Chase, let me say a couple of things that we've got in the queue and draw those to your attention. So next Wednesday on July 1st, uh, we'd like, like you to invite you to join another webinar, and this one will be uh, an economic forecast that we'll have with Stuart Hoffman. Uh, Mr. Hoffman is an economist with PNC and uh, is a frequent visitor and guest on national television shows, and he's uh, going to provide a regional and national forecast for how the economy is doing, and we look very much forward to his presentation, and that'll be next Wednesday. So if you'd like to join that, uh, just as you did today, uh, go to dscc.com um, and register. We also have another uh, a really terrific event coming up on July 21st, and this will be a virtual conference, and this will be covering a number of different topics, manufacturing in Delaware, workforce development, um, and uh, how Delaware compares to surrounding states, um, what the office environment ought to look like in a post-COVID-19 kind of a setup. Um, we've got a range of different speakers, uh, both uh, from Delaware and then from uh, all over the country. And I think this will be a very, very substantive conversation, including uh, our legislative leaders and the governor are gonna join us as well. So for this, please, again, go to dscc.com and register, and you'll uh, be able to join the conversation. If your business is interested in sponsoring, we would certainly welcome uh, your sponsorship as well. So with that, let me, um, let me turn this over in just a moment to uh, one of our board members, Tom Horn, who is with Chase, and uh, Tom is, uh, and the company has graciously agreed to sponsor today's conversation. It's an important conversation about what employers can do to help advance the interests and, and, and uh, their diversity of people from the black community, minority communities uh, as well. The, um, I was struck by um, a conversation in a, uh, an interview that Ken Frazier from Merck gave uh, some time ago, uh, maybe about a month ago. And he said, you know, we're so divided in many different ways, our clubs, um, our neighborhoods, um, but where we work, perhaps the military and sports teams are some of the few places left in our country where you don't get to choose who you associate with. And so his comment was, look, businesses have to lead in this conversation and lead in reform. And so we're very interested to hear what our presenters have to say today. So without any uh, further delay, let me uh, invite uh, Tom Horn from Chase, who's uh, graciously agreed to sponsor today's conversation and let uh, Tom make a few comments. So Tom. Thank you, Mike, uh, very much. And good morning, everyone. And for those of you I, I have not yet met, uh, my name is Tom Horn, and I am the Delaware market leader for J.P. Morgan Chase. So on behalf of our firm, and especially our over 11,000 employees here in Delaware now, we are very proud to sponsor today's event, which I think, and, and I think, Mike, you mentioned you agree, is probably the most important of this series so far, um, titled Creating a Door of Opportunity and an Employer's Role. And more than anything, I think this is a chance for us as a uh, leadership community to discuss the opportunity gap that exists in Delaware, that exists in our nation, as Mike mentioned, especially as it pertains to the black community, but more importantly, to talk about what we as the business community, we as the business leaders in Delaware can, can do and how we can act to help to close that, that opportunity divide. Closing the, the opportunity gap through workforce development and support of policies that drive inclusive economic growth is a high priority for J.P. Morgan Chase. We believe that all corporate citizens and the business community have to play a very, very active role in this or it won't happen. And so it's uh, it's become a real strong area of focus for our company over the, the past many years. And 
we at JPMorgan Chase aim to address this both internally and externally. And I'd, I'd love to just share a few examples that we're doing that maybe will spur some thoughts in your own mind as well. Several years ago, we launched a program called Advancing Black Pathways, and it actually built on an internal program called Advancing Black Leaders. And Advancing Black Pathways is externally facing, and it strives to help the black community in three key areas, education, career opportunities, and financial health, whether it's individual health or the health of a business. In 2015, we created an Entrepreneurs of Color Fund, which provides access to both capital and advisory services for minority entrepreneurs. And since 2019, have committed $17 million to that program. Uh, thinking younger, uh, we have committed over the next five years to hire 4,000 black students, primarily from historically black colleges and universities. And even younger than that, think more the high school level. Over the next 10 years, we're gonna work with 1,000 youth to provide them with the skills they need to enter the workforce through a program we call the fellowship initiative inside of our company. And then finally, on a, on a much more local level, our commitment to workforce development and creating more diversity in the talent pipeline has led us to some really successful partnerships with the likes of Year Up here in Wilmington, across the country actually, uh, and Zip Code Wilmington that have proven to be very, very successful for us. So they're just a few examples of what we're doing at JP Morgan Chase, but we have a lot more to learn. We all have a lot more to do, and, um, and hopefully we can get some ideas today. And since we all have a lot more to learn, I'm super excited about uh, our speakers today, Dr. Stephanie Creary, from uh, University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business, and my good friend and fellow William Penn Colonial, Dr. Tony Allen, the president at Delaware State University. So uh, with that, Mike, I'll turn it back to you to get us started. Great, great. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate that very much. And again, thanks to you for your leadership um, in Delaware and beyond, and also um, for all that the company does um, here locally and around uh, the globe. Um, with that, um, let me invite uh, Stephanie Creary from uh, the University of Pennsylvania, as uh, Tom alluded, and ask her for her remarks. She's joining us. And uh, uh, let me remind everybody, this is an on the record conversation. We have several members of the media who've decided to join us today. And so uh, without uh, any further delay, uh, Stephanie, uh, the, the microphone is yours. All right, I am really sorry that you all aren't able to see me live on video. Um, but with that said, I am um, really excited to be presenting to you some thoughts that I've been having over the last couple of weeks with respect to how do we begin talking about race in the workplace. And I want to start here because I have learned, uh, certainly over the past three years that I've been teaching a diversity course at the Wharton School, among students who've electively decided to join my course, that of all the topics we can talk about, you know, they can talk very clearly about gender, they can talk about their educational experiences, students can talk about their internship experiences, and this is both undergraduate and MBA students. But what they seem to have the hardest time, above all, are, are talking about issues around race. And so I don't enter into our conversation today thinking that our audience would be any different. Um, so I would like to offer you some thoughts that uh, originally started off as LinkedIn musings that have now turned into uh, a series of uh, pub online published um, uh, reports. So if you go to the next slide, you will see uh, three uh, headlines. The first is a framework for leading com classroom conversations about race. And so I first published a, a LinkedIn post um, that was about my experiences actually starting to teach this diversity course at, at the Wharton School uh, three years ago. So I came to Wharton in the fall, or actually it was July of, of 2017, and it was after a series of heightened racial tensions, um, certainly in the U.S. nationally, but also on campus. Um, around the time of the last, uh, the last presidential election. And um, what this article, if you uh, tune into it, it's actually on my LinkedIn uh, page, but it's been published by Harvard Business School Publishing Education. Um, I, I comment on how what was really um, hard was entering into this space, teaching a, a, a class about diversity to students who had just received um, within the last year 
uh, an email um, suggesting that they would be lynched in some capacity. And so it was really a harmful experience for our students. Um, and then I was an educator and also a scientist primarily who was, who was asked to teach a course to sort of try to come up with some solutions to help the students through this process. Um, the interesting piece you all should know is that there are not a lot of African American students taking my diversity courses, which I, I think is often um, a misnomer and a misperception around who actually takes these courses. As I mentioned, it is an elective, so anybody can take it. And, and what I have seen on average is about 50% of the students who take my course are identified as US citizens and the other 50% are international students. Um, and so that also makes conversations around race very tricky and challenging because people in other countries have been taught um, a different set of belief systems around race and ethnicity, including whether we should talk about it or not. I will also say that among the US students, most of the students who take my diversity course are white females. And so a lot of the conversation around diversity in, in, in organizations talks about gender. And so we have those challenges and opportunities. And so, as I mentioned, the framework was first originally um, meant to offer educators a perspective on how do you facilitate classroom conversations about race. And then I was asked by my own institution, Wharton, to um, reframe this race framework for, for middle managers. And so the knowledge at Wharton piece you can find that online by just Googling how to begin talking about race in the workplace. Um, that piece, which I'm told already has 13,000 hits, which I'm quite surprised by given what my original intention was, uh, reframes the framework around how middle managers can effectively facilitate conversations about race in their teams. And then lo and behold, a couple of days ago, I just caught wind that the World Economic Forum um, had picked up this framework and republished it. And so the green slide is the quote that they've used in all over social media, over Twitter and LinkedIn to summarize what they believe was a major takeaway from my article, and that is to eradicate systemic racism. It's important for managers to empower employees and provide them with resources for having productive conversations about race. And so what I'm going to do here today is just briefly go through this framework um, so that you can um, see it. But like I said, there is more context and there are more tips and resources highlighted um, if you go to the, the original source. So with that, we'll move to the next slide, which has R for reduce anxiety. So if there's anything that I've learned from my classroom experiences, but also in my more recent conversations and trainings I've been doing with companies, is that uh, most people are anxious around about talking about race. And I will tell you, I named the framework race for a reason, because I have learned that we have a very hard time just saying the word race. So, so for me, if, if I just called the framework race, then it's kind of unavoidable that people have to say the word multiple times and then just normalize this as a concept, just like we normalize gender, just like we normalize uh, the word professional. So with that said, um, my, my perspective uh, suggests that we're only going to get better at talking about race and, and reduce some of the anxiety that we feel in talking about race um, by actually talking about race. And so I note here that uh, managers and employees, um, and we can take this outside of the work, set, uh, work setting to Americans and people who are non-Americans, all feel uncomfortable talking about race. Many of us were taught, socialized to be colorblind, and that means not to pay attention to differences, and also with the belief system that if we paid attention to differences, that might increase bias or increase uh, racial tension. There are, there's actually a number of scientific studies that say that's not the case. The more that we actually pretend that race isn't a factor or that we don't have different races, um, what the studies have shown is that we actually tend to engage in more biased behavior. And, and what I've also learned is that people tend to fear being called racist. So in the knowledge at Wharton version and the world economic version of the, the framework, I said that managers can help uh, employees feel less anxious and more efficacious about engaging in these conversations related to race by um, creating uh, norms. And so in the piece, I talk around about some of the norms that can be um, created so that these conversations go better. And I will tell you the number one norm that comes up, particularly among my MBA students, is to not attach people's names outside the classroom to the conversations that they gave inside the classroom. So uh, everybody respecting the need to feel confidential was certainly something that is really important. 
The next slide gives you A, and A is to accept that anything related to race, including your own race, is either going to be visible or invisible in this conversation. So I'm a black African-American woman. Uh, my, my history in this country, my ancestors' history in this country goes back generations. And so I was taught from a very early age about my race and, and how that can be consequential in, in the US, in, in my educational environments, and also in my work experiences. So for me, race is a very salient feature, and I see other people's races, and I don't pretend that it isn't. But I acknowledge that many individuals were taught differently. Um, if they're referred to, for example, as white, that's not a characteristic with which they identify. So sometimes these conversations are hard when we're coming from different belief systems around if race is actually a, a, a lived experience for us or whether it's something that other people are projecting on us. And so what I suggest is that, you know, we really need to find these extremes beyond um, the invisibility of race, but also the hyper visibility where it's the only lens through which we see people. So finding a place where we normalize race as a, as a meaning, as a dimension of diversity that's meaningful. And so one of the things that I suggest is, is uh, to be able to talk about um, what are the positive and negative experiences that you've had when your race is visible is a good starting point. Moving on to C, um, it becomes so important in, in conversations about race that we acknowledge that many of us are not experts and many of us have, again, a lot of anxiety in talking about this, but there are a lot of people out there, including in your organization and professors like me um, and you know, co college presidents like Dr. Tony Al Allen who, who are experts in this topic and you and your managers and your employees would best be served by leaning on these individuals. There will probably be people who are black in your organization who are experts on race and diversity, but we all know that just because you, you're black doesn't mean that you, you, you are an expert on the topic. And um, so what I suggest is that everyone um, regardless of their race, including white employees and managers, learn to get more confident in facilitating conversations about race, but that might mean you need to seek out experts to help you. Um, and so also being able to um, give employees uh, the opportunity to cultivate these networks as well. So they may come to you and maybe you're not especially confident. So who can you point them to? Which resources can you point them to so that they can help to uh, be more effective in dealing with issues of race as well? And then E, um, E is expecting that you need to provide some answers practical tools, skill-based frameworks. So the race framework came out of a question or a, an opportunity that I had to share with an audience of educators how I tackle issues of racial equity in the, com in the classroom. And I tend to create a lot of um, mnemonics. That is actually how I learned in school. So you, know, you, you, you often do what you were taught. And so I tend to create a mnemonics like race as a way to help people retain um, information. And so sometimes that is, is what is important is for you to create the, your own framework, but sometimes there are other tools that exist out there. There's this long-standing program on intergroup dialogue that came out of the University of Michigan in around, I believe it was 2000, when they were um, having a sort of a lot of court cases around could they use race as a factor in, in admissions. And it was found that they couldn't use race as a factor, but that whole process of, of, of dealing with the legal issues around race and racism um, had really created quite, uh, I would say, uh, a damage, uh, create, create, created a, quite a bit of damage in their culture. And so this program and this research around intergroup dialogue, how do you talk effectively about race and racism, came out of Michigan's work. And certainly that is, um, it's a lot of science on it. And I actually have adapted uh, this whole platform for how I get students in my class to talk about race. And so for managers and employers, you can adapt these resources as well um, to make yourself uh, feel like you have science to lean on when you're engaging in these conversations. So lastly, in closing, I can tell you, even as a black woman who has been studying issues of race and diversity for 14 years, speaks to in, uh, employees, senior leaders, next week I'm facilitating a conversation with a senior team around systemic racism, I still feel anxious about having conversations about race because there's all these mixed messages. I question myself. I question whether it's the right thing. Um, 
And I think that's normal. It's normal. Um, but if we're going to try to eradicate issues of systemic racism and justice, we have to do better and we have to have resources for having more productive conversations about race. I would say that grounding them in evidence, even if it's citing my race framework, um, and certainly there's other more scientific research out there to lean on, that's better. And along with your good intentions, is better than not talking about race at all. Thank you so much for your time. I will turn it over to Dr. Tony Allen. Sorry. No, that's great. Thanks, Stephanie. Tony. Hey, Mike, uh, thank you and good morning. I'm quite pleased uh, to be with everyone this morning. I can't say enough about uh, my good friend uh, Tom Horn, who I had the privilege of uh, growing up with. Uh, it is one thing uh, to know somebody in your professional life, but to, to know them from long ago and to watch not only their um, ascension, with respect to their professional career, but their commitment to issues like these is quite humbling. So Tom, I'm proud of you. I hope, hope you're proud of me. Uh, just two Newcastle boys trying to do the right thing. And uh, Mike, I want to say uh, thank you to you uh, for this particular effort by the chamber. Uh, these things are hard, as Dr. Creary alluded to, but they are quite necessary and long overdue. Uh, so I am going to go through my presentation in a little different way. I think Dr. Curry kind of set the tone for how we should be thinking about these things, but I want to give you a sense of uh, my own personal story, what has led uh, me uh, to this work, and uh, some of the things I'm talking about now pretty regularly, having the great responsibility to educate about 1,700 uh, black young black men um, every day at Delaware State University. Uh, so the first is this. Uh, I I am now three years at Delaware State University, six months as its president. I spent 15 years uh, in corporate America at Bank of America and then its uh, uh, legacy uh, organization, MBNA. Uh, there was an old quoted MBNA that said, what, what gets measured gets attended to, what gets attended to gets done. And I'll come back to that quote because I think it's fairly, fairly uh, prescient and relevant uh, for this topic this morning. I also founded the uh, Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League, which as many of you know, is a civil rights organization, as well as Public Allies, uh, which was a very diverse uh, institution for young people interested in public service. Uh, but when I started uh, along my professional journey, I was actually a sophomore at the University of Delaware, uh, and I was driving two friends home um, after a party. Uh, I dropped one at a dorm on the west side of campus, the other at a dorm also on the west side of campus and was returning home. I lived on the north side uh, and was immediately stopped uh, by a police officer uh, for driving um, suspiciously. And uh, uh, I was then questioned uh, pretty aggressively about uh, my being a student at the University of Delaware and then spent a night in jail. And uh, I tell you that story because I'm not all that surprised about the things that we are seeing uh, here today. Uh, because I was prepared for that moment uh, because my family told me that that might that moment might happen to me as a black man in America. That was 30 years ago. Um, and I have since had three boys, uh, AJ, uh, Brooks and Jacob, and I have had to have a similarly situ situated conversation with each of those boys that regardless of what you're attempting to do uh, from a success standpoint, how many degrees you might have uh, over the course of your life, uh, the contributions you're trying to make in the world, uh, the world as such, particularly in the American context, is such that you need to be careful about your thoughts and behavior uh, in civil society, particularly as it relates to your engagement uh, with law enforcement. That, that, is, that is the talk, it's called the talk. And uh, there are very few, uh, if any, uh, black men in America that either haven't gotten that talk or given that talk uh, to their young sons. So what do we do about all of those things? If you go to the next slide, uh, what I think is important um, about uh, this moment is that there are young black men responding and they're responding in very, very thoughtful ways. Uh, most notably now, I have a 17, excuse me, a 19 year old uh, sophomore at Delaware State University. Uh, Jelani Bryant, who is a political science uh, major, as I was 30 years ago, uh, who was leading a protest in Middletown uh, just a couple of months ago. And when I thought about uh, what he was doing, not only was I 
uh, compelled to join him uh, and support him, but I wanted to listen. And I think that's one of the things we haven't done uh, thoughtfully enough uh, in this context. We have not uh, listened. Uh, you all may know uh, a man named Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson, in my view, is the foremost civil rights attorney in America. He's from Delaware. He runs the Equal Justice Initiative. And he has four key points um, that I, I think about pretty consistently. And I believe we all should be thinking about pretty consistently. Uh, one is uh, getting approximate, which is effectively means that we need to get closer to one another, particularly those folks uh, we don't look like or uh, the neighborhoods we don't come from, uh, particularly in distressed communities and understand the situation at a much deeper level. It's not enough for us to watch it on TV or talk uh, at our country clubs uh, about the conditions of the day. It really is, can we roll up our sleeves uh, and get connected to those communities uh, thoughtfully and recognize that whether you're African-American, Latino or white, uh, it, it, there's no monolith. There's no certain way to be black. There's no neighborhood that's exclusively black that doesn't have similar characteristics to other neighborhoods. Uh, but understanding in real ways that the disparities um, that we face uh, that are often across the color line uh, can only be recognized if we are in fact approximate. So get proximate uh, to those issues. Uh, the second uh, Brian talks about is changing the narrative that creates uh, policy problems. I think it's very important um, that we have an honest conversation about narrative and storytelling. And I heard uh, Stephanie very clearly uh, in her closing when she talked very exclusively about being a foremost expert uh, with respect to race and still having uh, her own personal challenges in talking uh, about it for what it might mean, for what it might say, for who it might offend. Um, th those kinds of things are real uh, for all of us. And I think the hard conversations are pretty uh, important, uh, particularly for uh, folks who don't typically have those discussions. I can tell you uh, that I've had no less than 40 calls um, from white friends. Just ask me if I'm okay and uh, really admitting that they had no idea how uh, deep uh, this particular moment was. And I've always said uh, in each of those conversations, what happened as it relates to the murder of George Floyd is that we all happened to be home and uh, were bound to our home, looked at the TV collectively and couldn't turn away um, for what had been a long standing issue that is deeply seated in our American context. Uh, so our ability to really change the narrative about uh, that story starts with us being honest about what that means, what we don't understand, and asking for help as we move forward. Uh, the third piece is to stay hopeful, uh, Brian alludes to. And I can tell you that my sense of what's happening now is not a uh, violent protest. My sense is that uh, there is hope among us in the American context. And this is how I know uh, when I've, I've gone to uh, three now, and what I see uh, is, the, is the racial diversity and ethnic diversity of America standing uh, against what they see as uh, complete injustice and recognizing uh, that this moment is, is a little different uh, than what they've experienced uh, before. That That is hope and hope can change in uh, to real real beliefs. As I said, uh, you can't just uh, hope things will change, but it really starts there. And our ability to, to then measure uh, what we really want uh, will get attended to over time. And then lastly, what I'd say is uh, being, uh, what Brian says, is being uncomfortable uh, is important as well. Uh, it's, it's not uh, insignificant that we will make mistakes uh, as we have conversations with each other. We'll likely say the wrong things. Uh, we'll not always get it right. Uh, sometimes we'll get mad uh, one with another. And on balance, I think all of that uh, is okay. Uh, what's not okay is silence. I'll say that again. What's not okay is silence. And for far too long, uh, we've had silence on these uh, kinds of issues. And while many have expected uh, your, your black friend uh, to step up and make commentary. Um, this is not not that time. Um, it's really all of us to look deep inside of ourselves and understand uh, that the moment is ours, that we are living uh, around an American problem that we can solve uh, together. 
So as the leader of uh, Delaware State University, you're only a historically black college and university uh, in Delaware. Uh, my vision is that we are the most diverse contemporary uh, HBCU in the nation. And I say those three things as pretty important. First, um, diversity is a great strength. We don't run away from that. Uh, and as it relates to who we are, where we come from, or who we love, all those things are fairly important uh, when you're trying to build a civil, more equitable, uh, more perfect union. Second, contemporary, that's where the business and community comes in. Uh, we at Delaware State want to be able to train uh, our students and give them uh, real world skills in the 21st uh, century America. One of the things uh, that I uh, really can't stand uh, when I'm talking to some of my uh, business colleagues is when they say we'd love to hire uh, more uh, people of color, uh, but we can't find them. Uh, that, that, is, that means that you're not, not looking hard enough. Um, there are many, many talent pools, whether that be at HBCUs or other institutions um, that are working with young people to provide them the real skills, but, but taking the opportunity and the chance uh, to make sure that you can build a, a real talent pipeline for them is not only uh, a good moral practice, in my view, it's good business um, as we move forward here. And then the last piece is uh, HBCU. Uh, just remember that in my view, HBCU is a proxy uh, for those folks who have been either overlooked um, or locked out of the higher education uh, system. I have the great fortune of having more dreamers, children of undocumented workers at Delaware State University than any other college university in the country. I uh, just graduated our first cohort. Uh, they graduated an average GPA of about 3.6 and uh, are across many disciplines, uh, whether that be STEM, humanities, art, et cetera. And uh, one of the images uh, that is most notable uh, to me is an image of a guy named Kevin Gutierrez who just recently graduated fall of 2017, uh, when he said to then Senator Carper, after an executive order came out about uh, the prospects for himself and his family to stay in the country, that the American flag is the only flag, flag I've ever pledged allegiance to. That kind of notion, that kind of power um, is what this country really was built on. And it's our um, perspective and I think responsibility to make sure um, that our responsibilities uh, match our rhetoric. Uh, we have great rhetoric around who we are and who we want to be. Uh, it's up to us, particularly uh, the leaders across uh, various sectors, most notably in the business sector, um, to lead from the front in that way. So I'll stop there, uh, Mike. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity. And I know Stephanie and I are happy to take questions. That's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, appreciate uh, the remarks that both of you made. Let me um, let me uh, put this out to you because um, Tony, uh, we'll we'll go to you first, and then we'll get Stephanie's reaction as well. Because you just you, you you touched on the topic of people that say, "Geez, I can't find people." In thinking about this, it struck me that you know there are a number of HBCUs around the country, uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, uh, Morehouse, Grambling etc. Of course, Dell State. And over the decades, hundreds of thousands, if not several million people have graduated. And so, at the, and this is over decades. So where are the alums? And maybe that's, maybe that's the problem that we're trying to address right here and right now. Where are they in all of uh, uh, the private sector in America? Where, where, where have they found themselves and what kind of follow ups does the university do and um, what more can be done? I know that in Stephanie and when we get to you uh, on this topic, I mean, you and I, when we, we talked briefly, we talked about, you know, recruitment, advancement, retention. Um, those are all important topics. So Tony, uh, your thoughts first, please. So Mike, just to give uh, the team perspective here, uh, there are about 101 historically black colleges across the country. Uh, every year, um, they educate about 300,000, uh, 350,000 uh, students. And you are right uh, that uh, we have educated millions over a couple of generations now. What I can tell you as well is about 50% of all African-American professionals today um, got their graduate degree from an HBCU. 
Uh, most of the, about 60% of all lawyers got their undergraduate degree from an HBCU. The same is true for doctors uh, and folks in the STEM disciplines. Uh, so what I would say is that they're in, they're in your communities uh, and doing all the things um, that we do um, to honor our, ourselves, our families, and our communities. And obviously, we have about 21,000 living alumni uh, and we keep up to, with them pretty regularly and then use their expertise in specific ways. After the murder of George Floyd, I had a university forum, uh, a weekly forum I'm doing uh, every every week since the pandemic. And I asked uh, Matthew Horace, who is a, a former federal law enforcement official and uh, the author of an award winning book called Black and Blue and the head of the Newcastle County Police, Vaughn Bond. Uh, who both of whom are alum to come speak with us on the topic race relations uh, in America and uh, our ability to use them uh, for those um, specific kinds of expertise not only is inspiring uh, but it shows uh, just how important uh, HBCUs are and uh, how when we when we are asked uh, we come together um, to stand stand up for each other so I can tell you um, most of my friends uh, who happen to be black professionals uh, got their undergraduate degree from an HBCU. And as you can see now, many corporations are making significant contributions as a result of the unrest uh, in America, which I think is great. Uh, but more important uh, is your ability to actually engage your employees, uh, many of which you'll find uh, have networked themselves and are living a life uh, that is really about uh, providing for themselves and their families, and you need to challenge them um, to help you think about creating a more diverse workplace in your community. Appreciate that. Stephanie? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to preface what I'm about to say by, by stating that I am not at all suggesting do not recruit from the University of Pennsylvania, nor am I suggesting <laughs> do not recruit our students from Morton. I will um, just add um, some support for what Tony is saying. Um, and, and I'm gonna put this in the context of, of classroom conversations. So my MBA students, um, for all intents and purposes, have been extremely successful in their careers. They have had opportunities unlike any other. Um, and so when I look at a number of the black students who are MBA students at Wharton, um, who are taking my class, a number of them have in, attended um, HBCUs undergraduate. Um, and so I know that part of the strategy in diversifying from a racial perspective and actually attracting um, and recruiting more African-American students to the Wharton School has been to look at talent who went to a historically black colleges and universities. That said, I'll never forget the story of one black student, MBA student, who told me he is a tech uh, a recruiter he had been in his previous career prior to his MBA, a recruiter for a, a Fortune 100 tech company, big name brand company. And he said how he had to spend an enormous amount of time speaking with recruiters and with hiring managers about the value of HBCU education. And I was absolutely mortified to know that that is what is happening. And I am not quite sure, maybe that's the systemic racism, I shouldn't say maybe, that is the systemic racism that we're talking about, is that we've decided that the quality of education at an HBCU is inferior to the education at a school like Wharton. And, and I find that hard to believe that we can continue to perpetuate that myth when a lot of the people who work at my school and who attend my school went to an HBCU. So I, I think we have to do a lot more work, and I don't think all of that work should be on the HBCUs, um, and certainly not on the people who attended them, to make sure that we are clear that the difference between an education at an HBCU and a Wharton is, is we have a lot more money at Wharton. We have a lot more resources, and we can spend that, and we can invest in ourselves and in people. I will say this is that I'm, I'm proud that Wharton has established in the last few years an alliance with Morgan State University and HBCU in Maryland. Uh, we and other elite institutions, meaning elite that we have a lot of resources, not elite that our education is necessarily better, uh, need to do a better job of partnering with HBCUs and I think employers need to do the same. Great, thank you for that. Um, Appreciate uh, both of you and your comments there. Um, I have three uh, children myself and they're all in college and uh, that's a 
know, I, I might need a Wharton MBA person to help guide my finances going forward, or maybe Tom Horn can uh, and somebody at Chase can guide me through my challenges. But um, my my middle child is uh, at the University of Iowa, and she's actually in their creative writing program and studying uh, to be an educator. And she uh, shared with me uh, uh, some uh, connections that she's had with uh, Jane Elliott, who uh, is uh, quite an interesting figure from uh, uh, from several decades ago uh, as a, uh, uh, a school teacher in Iowa. And uh, she talks a lot, uh, Jane Elliott, about um, equal versus equity. And um, for maybe a number of our listeners and uh, uh, people who are watching this today and who will watch it in the future, Maybe they don't understand the difference between the two. Uh, I can tell you that I did not. I don't think I fully appreciated uh, what the difference between those two things may be. So, Stephanie, let me ask you first to uh, help define that and, and maybe help uh, provide some things that people can think about in, the, in a business setting and how those differences really matter. Yeah, so I think I'll be quite simplistic in my explanation of this. So equality is is recognizing that we all need the same, we all deserve the same, and everything should be the same. So we should all get the same opportunities, we should all get the same resources, we should all get the same pay, um, so all things should be equal. Um, but what equity does, a conversation about equity, is it recognizes that that's an aspiration. Um, and what equity recognizes is that some individuals and some groups of individuals have been historically disadvantaged such that giving them the exact same thing that you gave someone else is not going to bridge the gap. And we were talking about the opportunity gap. So um, let us let me go back to the conversation around educational institutions. Uh, we have HBCUs that historically do not have the same level of resources as, a, as a, a, an institution like Wharton and like UPenn. Uh, you take two students. Uh, and you recruit them into your organization. And for and they're, they could be performing just as well as one another, but you have to recognize that it is possible that the person who attended the HBCU may not have had the same opportunities, the same number of internships, the same exposure to people with power and with and, and mentors and sponsorship that the person attending Wharton had, did. That doesn't mean that, um, either individuals more or less capable, but a, what a conversation around equity might say is we have to make sure that the person who attended an HBCU has more uh, mentors, has more programs, and maybe we create a specialized program for people who have attended HBCUs to make sure that they understand um, what the other opportunities might exist that maybe they did, weren't privy to um, having not attended a different institution. So uh, equity recognizes that there's information asymmetry, there's resource asymmetry, and that doesn't have anything to do with qualifications or competence. I'll turn it over to Tony. Tony? Uh, yeah, thank you, Stephanie and Mike. Uh, the only thing I, I put in context here, I remember I said uh, all races aren't monoliths. Uh, so when you think about uh, black people, um, there, there's an array of uh, different types of backgrounds uh, from the black experience. We're all um, tied uh, by a clear destiny, particularly in the American context, um, that stems from how we got to America. Uh, but you can see us as diverse. He, here's what I'd say, though, because uh, it goes to Stephanie's point. Uh, just take net, net uh, financial worth, your net worth. Uh, there, there are many studies across the country, uh, particularly uh, as around, around race, around net worth. Uh, the average net worth uh, for an average white family uh, is somewhere in the twenty to twenty-five thousand dollar range. Um, the same, and that's regardless of an uh, economic uh, uh, income stream. In uh, the context for African Americans, it's less than zero. So even as an African American uh, middle class person, it's more likely. Uh, that when you take uh, all of your assets and liabilities, regardless of your circumstance in life, it's significantly less than your white counterpart um, at, at you know at at your respective uh, workplace. That has much to, much to do with equity. So when you talk about uh, trajectory, life chances, how you send your kid to college, uh, what you're able to do uh, with respect to your family and your community. 
Um, you're starting from a different point many, many times because if you're like me, you were the first guy in your in your family to go to school. Right. So uh, that comes with certain things that hopefully I will be able to give some things to my children that my parents weren't able to give to me. And recognizing when people talk about the systemic nature of race, right, recognizing that those implications uh, were first as a matter of law and then became a matter of fact for many years, had significant implications on how we lived, how we were able to um, gain economic standing and puts us a bit, regardless again of our, our station in life, puts us a bit behind our white counterparts as a result. For me, that means that's the reason you go back into your businesses and look to the folks that you either work with or supervise and ask some real questions about uh, how we can advance um, their career and what they might need uh, to make that happen. That's great, thank you. Um, Let's let's talk about businesses because Tony, you're correct. I mean, sometimes we we think uh, things about things monolithically, and uh, you know, seldom are things that simple. Um, they're more far more complicated, and 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 the business sector clearly is one of those things too. Eighty percent of Delaware State Chamber of Commerce uh, members are by definition small businesses. We created a diverse supplier list. Um, uh, that we put on our website we uh, with, with businesses that identified uh, their ownership um, and and that's been of help to other businesses so let's talk about small businesses for a moment because they may be well as the name suggests small uh, specialty um, or perhaps in rural areas where being diverse is just a real challenge what thoughts ideas would you have uh, about that tony we'll start with you first and then we'll we'll go to uh, stephanie you know, um, really, my experience uh, has a lot to do with connecting uh, with people and seeing how uh, we can help one another. Um, my sense is when you're a small business, there are lots of opportunities for you to engage with other um, small businesses um, to support your own programming. And as I said at the start, uh, you're opportunity to do that as in, in a diverse context so really trying to find other folks who might have some goods and services that you need to grow your business um, who might be women or minority owned is a very very good place uh, to start what i think it does um, is build a natural connection uh, between two small business owners in some cases uh, in other cases i think it opens up um, customer clientele um, in a significant way i know that uh, the more uh, likely that a supplier of mine that might happen to be a small business uh, is engaged on issues uh, that are important to Delaware State, the more likely I'm going to give them uh, more business. So really being able to connect in that way, as I said, diversity is not just a good moral uh, choice. I think it's a, it's good business um, is particularly important. Uh, also, as it relates to who you employ uh, and the opportunities you have for them, I think that um, sends the right messages as well. So in many of these uh, particularly rural communities uh, there are lots of opportunities uh, for folks to employ uh, people who don't look like them or don't come or come from the other side of the tracks and i think that creates a, a natural um, connection both as it relates uh, to the, the moral uh, peak compass but also uh, extending uh, your client base in a substantive way appreciate that stephanie any thoughts on this yeah, so I'm going to pick up on the rural part first. Um, so what's interesting is, is we know that people, all people make decisions around where they want to work and they live by checking out the community. I'm going to sort of position a counter argument to the, to the idea of what rural has to um, give or not give to people of color, because I, I, I lived in a rural uh, community for two years in Cornell, Ithaca, New York, and it had a, a very relative to most rural communities had a, a, a relatively high percentage of African American people living there. And so I think, um, and I know some of the um, independent studies that have been conducted on why there are a, a good number of uh, black people living in Ithaca. Well, one is there's a university there, so that helps to attract uh, people. But two, it's because um, different communities have developed these networks that Tony is talking about, right? Educa the two educational institutions plus the community college system that is in 
um, in Ithaca has created uh, an alliance so that when one is trying to attract uh, communities of color to come and work or live in the area, they're able to say, we also have a partnership with Ithaca College and the community college system. Same works for businesses. So if a small business, I guess the moral is, is if the small business is trying to go it alone, you're going to have a harder time attracting. But if you have an alliance or a network with others, as Tony mentioned, that's really important. The last part I want to say is I lived in Boston for 16 years, and Boston is a city that prides itself on being diverse, but they have a very hard time attracting and retaining African-American uh, uh, people to uh, that city. Um, and so there's an organization called The Partnership um, that uh, does a lot of this work and working with employers to um, not only make sure that uh, they feel like they have the right messaging and the right resources to attract people of color to the organization, but they also offer programs to support uh, people of color so that when they have issues around what it feels like when I leave this job and go home, sometimes when I go home in the community, I have these experiences of racism and I don't know what to do with it and it makes me not want to stay here. They have a community of other people to lean on. So I think for small businesses, just to reiterate, yes, the networking and the alliance model that Tony proposes is important, but I also think it's up to the communities and business leaders to help support initiatives that are about trying to recruit and retain people of color in that community location. That's great. That's great. Thank you both for your answers there. Um, I might say we've got a number of other things we want to go through, and if uh, uh, you both will indulge us a little bit, I think we might run a little bit over today. Um, okay. Let me, thank you. Um, let me let me go to a question from uh, uh, a member of our Board of Governors, Grace Stockley, who asks, do you see the inequality in inner city majority black K through 12 education system as a factor in recruiting qualified black employees? And if so, what do you suggest to address this problem? Stephanie, let's start with you. Yeah, so I'm gonna go back to uh, Boston because I will say that when we start to look at um, communities that um, are known for their educational resources or regions that are known for their, their resources, that's sort of one of the primary industries in the Boston and Massachusetts area, right? So it's education and healthcare. And so certainly um, what I know from the work that is done by those institutions, again, along the lines of how do we attract uh, people to this area from other areas, but also how do we retain some of these students who are already here in Boston, it really is establishing alliances with a lot of different companies um, so that they don't lose talent. Here in Philly, the University of Pennsylvania is, is increasingly doing more work. I would say you know, we still have a long way to go at the University of Pennsylvania to uh, develop partnerships with some of the area schools. Um, we have summer programs. Um, that are designed to help us become a place where not only students want to uh, come, but also where they want to stay um, after they work. But it really does take these partnerships um, and uh, that really are in deep ties, I would say, to the community in order for these things to be successful. Tony, thoughts? So um, let, let me say this. And they might not answer the question directly at first. So if I'm if I'm wandering uh, for a while, forgive me. I'll try to be brief. Uh, so I appreciate the question uh, because clearly the systemic inequities that have plagued us from a K-12 um, education uh, perspective uh, for a long, long time are part and parcel of why we are here today. So I don't want th anybody to think that um, that is not key. Um, to all, many of the disparities um, that we see and uh, the quality of life for many African-American people in the country. Having said that, that is not an excuse uh, to, to be unable to find black talent. I just don't believe that. Um, I know well enough that in my own circles, um, there are many uh, men and women uh, of uh, good high intellect, good moral conscience, uh, who are stuck in jobs and or um, looking for new opportunities and don't quite frankly have the visibility of uh, a Tony Allen or a Stephanie Curry might have. Uh, so don't really have somebody try to try to open up that door for them. So uh, with all due respect, I think it's important if you believe in all this uh, that you look harder uh, because what will happen is uh, getting 
one uh, person of color in your shop in a key role, and I do mean in a key role, will extend itself um, to a whole world of people of talent. I'll give you one example. The picture behind me um, is a picture of the Ebony Tie Affair. The Ebony Tie Affair is held in Delaware every year, the Monday before Thanksgiving, and it is the largest gathering of Af African-American professional men uh, in, on the Eastern Seaboard. You can't find uh, enough talented uh, black men uh, at this at, at this particular affair that you wouldn't want to have working uh, at your company. And there are networks like this across um, the African American community um, throughout the country. So it, I remember what I said about Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson's first thought is get proximate, get closer to the those communities you want to affect. And I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, it might, it might help the point. Um, there was a time in my career that when somebody needed a, a African-American on their board of directors, I was one in Delaware. I was one of five people they called. Today, I'm one of 10 people uh, they call. That's not good enough. And that has a lot to do with our not being approximate one to another. Thank you both. Uh, let me let me you know I, I was struck by the um, I, I referenced earlier in my remarks uh, the interview that um, Ken Frazier gave and uh, let me um, go back to something that he talked about um, you know we're at a very disruptive time um, and, and every time we go through a, a large economic disruption um, businesses find ways to change their practices, change uh, how they do business because the, the times and conditions call upon them to do this. And the frequently the people who are hurt the most are the ones that have the least amount of skills because automation, artificial intelligence, uh, technology all finds ways to uh, make improvements and um, help businesses succeed in ways that they had not imagined, but they need to be creative and imaginative. And so I want to talk about um, the people we've been talking about, young um, black uh, men in particular, but men and women um, and, and other communities of color um, and, and the challenges that high unemployment rates in the black community have created and the challenges for them to, to move into meaningful jobs and meaningful work. But it's, I find it kind of interesting, and I'd like to get your perspective on this, that we're at a point today where you have a number of low-skill white workers who uh, are now being um, uh, displaced because of their absence of skills. And while they're in, maybe they may be in the same boat, uh, let's recognize that um, the white workers have not had the barriers uh, that race creates for uh, the the young black uh, men and women who are coming up into the workforce um, in our country. But uh, it's interesting, and I think there's a, a growing, uh, if you will, almost a political dynamic where they're going to be more similar in the future uh, than maybe they ever have been in the past. And, and, and I'd, I'd just like to see what you both think of um, think of that. Again, recognizing that um, um, young men and women in the black community have had other barriers. The groups are not equal in terms of you know their their uh, their ability to achieve uh, and and break through into employment circumstances. But they're finding themselves uh, in, in more of a common place today than maybe ever before. What do you think about that, Tony? We'll start with you. Yeah, but Mike, uh, you, you've raised a lot of important issues there. It goes back to Brian Stevenson's second point, change the narrative. Um, there, there is an undercurrent uh, narrative that kind of says that uh, many, many African-Americans, most African-Americans uh, make up um, the poor people in the country. I know you don't believe that, but the tr truth of the matter is most poor people in the United States are white. Uh, and it's been that way. Uh, and that's just a, a sheerly a volume thing, right? Do we have uh, a, a disparity as it relates to the number of uh, poor and unemployed uh, for black people? Sure we do. Uh, but your point about uh, it being much more uh, similar, dissimilar moving forward, I really think is a valid one. 
And unfortunately, a lot of the political forces of today have driven a wedge between people who really have very similar economic circumstances. Uh, Martin Luther King talked about this near the time of his death uh, when he kind of moved from or evolved uh, to the uh, Poor People's Campaign, uh, which he knew would bring together uh, more different races who were all experiencing uh, levels of trauma based on their economic uh, circumstance. So I do think um, that we need to, one, get rid of the political wedges that divide uh, those folks who are either uh, low-skilled workers or chronically uh, unemployed. Uh, that's another place uh, where the business community could take a lead or role. And then obviously begin to provide the requisite skills um, to make sure that we're preparing them for the 21st century. One of the things I didn't mention is that Delaware State University operates an early college high school for aspiring first generation college students. We've graduated two classes of those students. Those students can earn up to 60 college credits before they're ever admitted uh, into a college or university. And our, our students average about 53 credits, which makes them at the time that they enter college, a second semester sophomore, first semester junior. 53% of them come to Delaware State University, but they go to many other places across the country. And that is about being very deliberate about the target audience you want to serve, giving them a unique experience. And you know, my big problem now is finding a way to scale that over time. So I do think that uh, that is an important uh, question for us and goes to some of the things that Stephanie talked about in her model around how we think about um, race and how that is debilitating both for um, African Americans uh, and those folks who have, might be white that are, uh, again, experiencing the same level of trauma. Stephanie, your thoughts? Yeah, so if I just add quickly, I will say that, you know, sometimes we create this unnecessary and potentially harmful dichotomy that exists um, that's just about income, right? When we're talking about skills. Um, I will tell you, um, we certainly at Penn in the last several years have created more uh, initiatives around what we term uh, FIGLI, which is first generation low income students. And certainly that opens a dialogue around opportunity and resources and access to students across races. I will tell you, even in having conversation with students who are African American in my class, it is clear that some of them are from families where income is 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 a is a day to day expenses are are a difficult subject matter, and others have um, parents who attended Wharton uh, and and have MBAs from Wharton and are CEOs of big firms. Um, and so it really does matter. And we're talking about skills. I think a conversation around income is really important. But that said, I would invite everybody as they're trying to understand opportunity and education and access and really what systemic racism means. I would invite you to check out one of my favorite resources. It's become a favorite resource. If you go to Ben and Jerry's, yes, the ice cream company. <laughs> if you go to Ben and Jerry's website, they have an article that's called Seven Ways We Know Systemic Racism is Real. And it not only will talk about wealth, and I think Tony did a brilliant job of um, helping us understand the wealth gap. I've talked about the education gap, as has Tony. I want you to also look at employment, criminal justice, housing, surveillance, and healthcare. And that's how you'll know that when we're talking about black low-skilled workers as compared to low-skilled low white workers, these are not the same, right? The only thing that's similar is they're low skilled and probably low income, but there are so many other issues. So I just want to throw that out there as we're trying to educate ourselves um, and turning back to the conversation that we're having around equity. Both of these groups, both low skilled white workers and low skilled black workers and low skilled Asian workers and low skilled Hispanic and um, Latin, Latinx workers need um, investment. But depending on which group you're looking at, there are other resources and opportunities that they need in addition to the skills base um, support. Perfect. Um, no, I, I appreciate both of your uh, comments on, on that. That's a very, very helpful and a, and a series of really good insights. So thank you both for that. Um, we're going to wrap up here um, and, and, and go to some closing comments um, in just a moment. Um, we will. Um, uh, start uh, in reverse order. Um, so um, 
Tony, when we get here in, a, in another minute, just give me a minute. We will uh, we'll go to you for closing comments first and then and then Stephanie. But before we do, I want to again thank uh, Tom Horn and all the good folks at JP Morgan Chase for their sponsorship uh, of this program. Um, they've sponsored uh, a prior program and we certainly appreciate uh, their uh, contributions and uh, support of the Delaware State Chamber of Commerce. So thanks uh, again. Um, also want to um, remind everybody that we've got a, uh, conf a webinar webinar coming up next week with Stuart Hoffman, who's a chief economist at PNC. Uh, Stuart will be joining us uh, next Wednesday, July 1st. And then uh, we've got our virtual conference uh, coming up, as I mentioned earlier, on uh, July 21st. And um, that'll cover uh, a whole range of topics uh, under the general um, uh, subject of putting Delawareans back to work. Uh, with that, let me um, go to uh, Tony for closing remarks. Uh, Tony, but I'd ask you to kind of factor in one thing. Uh, my friend Alan Rogers at uh, the Keeney Company said, uh, uh, how do you feel about mentor programs? Does Delaware State have a business mentor program? Um, and do you have any suggestions, <coughs> training or guidance for mentees if a program exists? And I don't know if you can add that to any closing comments you want to make, but uh, 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 Alan's a good hearted guy and I'm, I'm sure he's interested in uh, what you might have to say about that, but uh, floor is yours, sir. And thank you again for participating today. Hey, Mike, thank you. Uh, this has been wonderful. And I, I again want to uh, thank Stephanie. I, I have not had the chance to uh, meet her personally, uh, but we have uh, a very good uh, friend in common. And I, I knew uh, that she would be excellent uh, in helping us uh, with this issue. I also want to thank uh, my dear friend uh, Tom Horn and Chip Rossi, uh, both of whom, again, uh, we all grew up in the same neighborhood. And uh, when these latest events happened, uh, I, I have not felt more supported uh, in, in a time in my life uh, than being able to count on them uh, who call me regularly, who encourage me, uh, who are doing things in their companies that are real and substantive. So Tommy and Chip, if you're out there, thank you. Um, oddly enough, Alan, this uh, there's a picture I'm getting ready to show you that starts with two uh, young men uh, in our College of Business uh, program, and they are uh, in a very long running uh, mentor program that's specifically designed for uh, young black men. So the only thing I would tell you is email me right away. Let's talk because uh, I want to get you uh, more closely um, connected. Our College of Business is a very strong one. And uh, we have done any number of things, both with uh, specific companies and uh, more broadly uh, to make sure that we are providing our students uh, significant opportunities. And here's how here's how I'll close uh, with the video. Uh, the video is called Sons. It's produced uh, by students at Delaware State uh, University in response to the murder of George Floyd. And uh, I think it tells the story uh, of where we are today and uh, how we need to move forward. So I'd ask the team to play uh, the video and that'll, that'll, those will be my closing remarks. All right.
I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Stephanie, um, your closing thoughts and comments uh, from today, and I very much appreciate uh, you joining us. Uh, your thoughts. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. I have three quick points. The first thing is, yes, we need to talk about race. And yes, white people need to talk about race too. So if you need help doing that, there are a number of experts in the universe who could possibly help you. Many of them are at universities. Many of them are at consulting firms. Please lean on them for help to help you facilitate these conversations in your leadership teams and also with your employees. Second, talk about opportunity. That is where uh, a lot of the focus should be because we need to challenge our assumptions around what we mean by qualified, what we mean by who gets ahead. It really is about resources and opportunities, so make sure you're having conversations about that. And finally, create a plan. This is a long game, folks. This is not going to be a problem that is going to be resolved anytime soon, and maybe not in my lifetime, maybe not in your lifetime, but if you start creating a plan, an action plan that has concrete, uh, concrete targets, concrete uh, systems, uh, that you want to examine, you want to audit, I think we'll be in a much better place a year from now than we are today. Thank you so much for having me. Great, thank you. Well, uh, to uh, to Tom Horn and uh, our friends at J.P. Morgan Chase, to uh, Dr. Tony Allen from Delaware State University and Dr. Stephanie Creary from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, this has been a really great discussion. Thank you uh, all for uh, your contributions today. Uh, I'm Mike Quaranta from the Delaware State Chamber of Commerce. Thanks again, and uh, everybody have a great day.